Alright, so it's time to get into the very fun topic of politics. You know, the fastest way to lose friends, acquaintances, careers, family, and your own sanity, as Extra Credits learned in their most infamous video. Believe it or not, despite what you might hear, Extra Credits for the longest time was at least okay with dealing with political topics. Even more than that, I thought that they were pretty good at dealing with political topics. They've done plenty of episodes on things like diversity, race, sexuality, religion, war, and many more controversial topics and they usually dealt with it with tact. Even when I didn't agree with their opinions, I thought that they'd argued them fairly well, and when I didn't agree with them, it ended up being more of a agree-to-disagree situation. That was until one particular video that I couldn't get past no matter how hard that I tried, and no, it's not the video that you're thinking about. It was their video on All Media is Political. This was the first Extra Credits video that I actually disliked. Believe it or not, I rarely hit the dislike button on a YouTube video, especially when it comes from a creator that I watch a lot. The thing is, when I watched this video at the first time, I couldn't exactly articulate why I disliked it. But let me tell you, I really disliked this video from the start. It felt like one of the most confused, disingenuous, and wrong videos that I had ever seen. And after getting into the really nitty gritty of it, I've come to the conclusion as to why I think this video is so awful. And the problems of it start to arise right at the beginning. As the political divides in our world have become increasingly pronounced, more and more frequently, on message boards, forums, and Steam reviews, I've seen the demand that creators, writers, and reviewers keep politics out of games. That is not possible. All media is political. Do you see what he did there? I don't blame you if you don't get it straight away. It took me a while to get, but that statement right there is why this video is so confusing. This is a classic example of doublespeak. You see, the word media has two different definitions. It can mean every single type of media, like books, movies, video games, etc. Or it can mean literally every single piece of media, like every video game ever made. You see, throughout this video, Extra Credits attacks a straw man. The argument about politics in media usually uses the second definition of media. In this video, Extra Credits attacks an argument made by the first definition. They seem to be arguing against people who want video games to not be political at all. Like, no video games should be political ever. This is known as the ambiguity fallacy, when you use a word with multiple meanings to argue against a point that no one has actually made. And this is one of the reasons why the video is so incredibly hard to parse. They seem to be arguing against two different things at once, and that's what makes the video so confusing. In the next segment of this video, he goes into very various examples of media that was politically motivated, or has some kind of political leaning. It really does make it seem like he's trying to argue that literally every single piece of media ever created was made from some kind of political motivation, which is ridiculous on the face of it. Then again, maybe not. Media is created by people. People are products of their culture and times, and so, intentionally or unintentionally, they are going to express their views through the outlets they have. Actually, now that I think about it, it makes a ton of sense. You see, I never really understood Blue Daba D before I actually watched this video, but now that I think about it, it's clearly a political statement on the evils of capitalism, and how even those who succeed in its oppressive systems are still so depressed that they cannot see anything positive in their lives. Seriously, Dan, this is a ridiculous idea. What's the political bent at my VCR repair manual. Luddism. See, you can't just extract politics from media. Because as we all know, Spyro the Dragon is some radical new take on sex and sexuality because they exist in a world of only male dragons, and somehow we're able to manage to reproduce and produce eggs. This is the kind of logic that gets people to attack the original Super Mario Brothers because it has a male plumber rescuing a female princess. You know, like every single fairy tale ever told for hundreds of years. Take a look at Tetris, any variation of it. Does any part of this game tell you anything about who Alexei Pajanov is, or what his political beliefs are, or even anything about his time. Most versions of Tetris don't even have any Russian imagery. There are plenty of examples of media that I can pull up that do not have any political message, overtly or even subtly. And if you want to move the goalposts and assume that Extra Credits is talking about art and not media in general, Tetris is art. Either games like Tetris and Pong that are clearly apolitical are art, or things like Shia LaBeouf setting himself on fire, or writing your name on a urinal is not art. Photographs are media, but you won't find the political bent in ones that came prepackaged with Windows XP. If these examples are too old for you, what is the political bent of Minecraft? Can you see any of Notch's personal beliefs in that game? I doubt it, considering a lot of people were surprised by them. Yes, people create media, 
and they're biased by their times and their environments. But a lot of people go beyond that and convey something of an entirely different image that has nothing to do with themselves. And besides, even if we could somehow extract politics from our entertainment, we would lose so much. Yes, go on, Dan. Cherry pick your examples. I can do the same thing. We need to remove politics from our media. It is the most disastrous thing ever. Because we have politics in our media, we have things like Birth of a Nation, Ghostbusters 2016, and oh yeah, Call of War as the Cartel. You know, the same game that you rallied against. You see, when people complain about games getting too political, I don't think that many people have a problem with politics in games in general. I'm sure that some of them do, but that's not the mainstream argument. The argument is that politics are often shoehorned in, that it's done as a marketing ploy, or just to virtue signal, or you know, just done badly. I know you don't want to give these arguments any sort of respect, but generally speaking, that's the only way to truly get rid of an argument. You have to talk people out of them on their level. This is why strawmanning is a bad idea if you genuinely care about your arguments. Many of the best creative works out there, the ones that leave us with something to think about, that inspires us to ponder our world and still sticks with us years later, they deal in political ideas. This is another thing that bothers me about this video. Dan keeps talking about politics like it's a positive thing, but in actuality, politics is a neutral thing. After all, propaganda, some of the most disgusting pieces of filth, retrograde manifestos, those are all media, and they are the most political media out there. But Dan talks like he thinks those things are amazing. After all, he says that being political is what makes media touching and deep. See what you could do with the straw man argument and why it's a bad form in debate? No, I don't think that he truly believes that propaganda propaganda from evil people are good works. He just argues like someone who does. Now, we can talk about how on the nose a work should be with its politics. That's totally worth debating. So, by extension, the debate we're having right now is not worth having, am I correct? Do you want to know what the actual problem that people are rallying against is in this debate? Remember the game Far Cry 5? When it came out, it was blasted by games journalists. Most of them did not like it. And do you know why? It wasn't buggy, it wasn't ugly, it wasn't glitchy, and it wasn't boring. No, countless games journalists attacked it because it took no political stance, and the journalists demanded that it say something big and important about our contemporary political environment. Generally speaking, when people say to get politics out of game reviews, that's the kind of stuff that they're attacking. Because journalists lately seem to be neglecting to do their actual job and reviewing something based on politics and not the actual quality of the media in question. But we shouldn't simply get politics out of games, whatever that means. Do you know what whatever that means in this context means, right? It means that they didn't even try to understand the opposing side. That's why this video comes off as so confused. They literally do not know what they're arguing against, which is an interesting endeavor, I will give them that. It's like me reviewing a television show that I've never seen before. Let me put it this way. If you don't actually understand where people are coming from, you need to do a better job in understanding them. If you literally do not understand the argument you're battling against, to me that means you did not make a good, honest effort to do so. Which is one of the main reasons that this video falls apart. It feels very much like it's talking about a topic in bad faith. We can handle politics. This medium is a big kid now. And we're just gonna hang on to that one. Even when it's unintentional, media shapes culture. You know, people who believe this do a lot more than rant about the gender politics of games like Ms. Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers, even though those are the ones that get all the attention. People who believe that all media is political do things like advocate for censorship, or try to remove books by very famous accomplished people. A university tried to remove the works of William Shakespeare because he was white. Mark Twain's works are frequently banned because they use the N-word. People go after Walt Disney and his works because they believe that he's anti-Semitic. People go after Ender's Game because of Orson Scott Card's opinion on gay rights, even though those are not communicated at all in Ender's Game. If what you're saying is true, and that media is so affected by its creators to the point where their politics are unable to be removed from them, what exactly do you think you're arguing here? Where does this road end? Culture shapes society. Really now, you're, you're going down that direction. I've heard this argument before. You know, the argument that states violent video games make people more violent. Yeah, believe it or not, the Nazi video wasn't the first time that they've actually had this argument. Oh, I'm sorry, according to these people, video games don't cause violence. They just cause racism and sexism and homophobia and Nazism and things that lead to violence. On some level, this is hilarious to me in an abstract sense of the word. People like the Extra Credits team, or people of their ilk, have been demonizing video games and the audience for video games for years now. They've made so many arguments about how video games lead to toxicity, 
and to certain types of prejudice because of the messages there within. Then their political opponents complained that video games are responsible for violence and one, two, three, video games no longer affect behavior. Yes, there's a bit more nuance to the argument, but the fact remains. People have pretty strong barriers when it comes to becoming psychopaths via the media. And the arguments that people like the extra heads to make when they try to argue that video games do affect one thing but not the other really makes it feel like they're suffering from cognitive dissonance. Either way, it murkies the waters. How much does media affect us? It seems like the same people are arguing not that much and a lot at the exact same time. Sure, video games won't get you to go out and commit violence, but if what they're arguing is true in terms of sexism and racism and prejudice, violent video games like, say, Manhunt would make people more desensitized to violence, stand by violence, and maybe even support violence. They touch on things like the CSI effect, which has absolutely nothing to do with politics, at least not directly. The CSI effect refers to when media shows you something over and over again that isn't quite true, but it becomes public expectation that it is true. The obvious example, and the naming example, is CSI reports the idea that people expect DNA evidence to be perfect. But there are other things like people with Tourette syndrome swearing all the time, being able to fire any handgun up to a hand cannon with one arm without dislocating your shoulder, or multiple personality disorder being the same thing as schizophrenia. These issues aren't political. They're not put into stories for political reasons. They're usually put into stories for dramatic effects or in worst case scenarios because the writers didn't do the research. This episode goes out of its way to explain why politics and media is such a good thing. But these examples here, the CSI effect, is one of the best arguments as to why media should not have politics in it at all. Dan argues that these pieces of media causing misinformation changed policy in his video that says we should just accept media being political. These attitudes, shaped by media, went on to affect our political realm and changed policy and law. They nudged the Overton window just a little bit. He says that with a smile. When the examples he used was 24 making people more accepting of torture, and CSI making it harder for police to conduct investigations. What the hell? Games like Papers, Please, and This War of Mine draw directly from our world and our politics for their very mechanics, while games like Cards Against Humanity not only leverage our political understanding for their humor, but get directly involved with politics. And Candyland is actually a determinist metaphor about how we really don't have any choice or free will in our life. How everything we do is basically determined by the random draw of a card until our game is finally over. You know that Cards Against Humanity is basically a sandbox, right? And quite honestly, depending on what your group finds funny, the politics of it can send the players in any direction. Cards Against Humanity is actually a perfect example of how the politics of a creator can have very little to no effect on the actual creation. Yes, the creators of Cards Against Humanity do have their own political bent, but that does not translate directly into the game. Also, I have no idea why you're defending Cards Against Humanity. Uh, does anybody want to break it to the extra credits team? But Cards Against Humanity kind of has, you know, Nazi references in it and it normalizes jokes about racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism. You see what I mean when I say that we literally can't get politics out of our games? Playing Dance Dance Revolution, a game where you just match arrows to lights, I'm gonna have to say no. And that might have been a bad example if it weren't for the fact that he said all media is political. When you say something like all is an example of something, all I need to do is bring up just one counterexample and the argument is automatically false. And that's the third fallacy that this video falls into, the composition division fallacy. It's when you assume that because some of the set has a quality, then all of the set has those qualities. Saying that all media is political in a sense is kind of like saying that all animals are mammals. You could point me to a lot of animals that are mammals, and I could see why you'd believe that, but I could easily point to so many animals that clearly are not mammals. You can say that a lot of media is political, but I can point to so many pieces of media that aren't. Unless you want to give me a dissertation on Dr. Seuss's There's a Wocket in My Pocket. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to agree with the creators. Right, except that people tend to get berated by the elites and the journalists if they don't agree with the popular politics in whatever media. Remember Ghostbusters 2016? I still have flashbacks. And I remember how everyone who didn't think that movie was the greatest thing ever and wasn't absolutely excited to see it was considered a sexist piece of shit. I do think that some people are way too harsh on a video game or any piece of media for that matter that has a main character who is of a marginalized group of people like people who hate The Last of Us 2 or Life is Strange because of them having LGBT characters and I know there are people who have a knee-jerk reaction to any kind of political discussion in their media but assuming that that's the entire argument here that that's everyone in the opposing camp that's a straw man now we should be civil with each other but it's okay for media to matter and for what media is saying to matter it's okay if it makes you angry or upset. 
it's okay to think that the politics expressed in a piece of media are great and support them, or to think that they are heinous and to fight against those politics. This is a difficult talking point because it's getting to be a bigger and a bigger problem. Like the aforementioned Far Cry 5, people who are supposed to review video games disregard the actual game and rate it on its political merit, and this is happening in every piece of media. There are people who are supporting a piece of media, bad or good, before it even comes out because of the political message it avows. And that wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the fact that to be a critic you have to put your politics aside and judge a piece of media on its other qualities, its more objective qualities. This is why people hate reviewers and critics getting so political. It's because it clouds their mind into the actual merits of the game or the piece of media that the people care about. You know, the reason that people are looking up a review in the first place. Judging a piece of media solely based on its political views is a bad idea, especially if you care about that particular political view. When your political belief is represented in bad media after bad media, what happens is that your political belief gets to be less and less tolerated. It's a bad idea to praise or demonize a piece of work for its political talking points alone. Do you really think that people are going to be more excited about all female reboots after Ghostbusters 2016 was a bomb and a terrible movie? Even ignoring that, people who make media for the sole purpose of being political tend to make some of the worst pieces of dog shit in history. So I'm not accused of just attacking one side. Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged is a terrible book for this reason. It's even okay for corporations to say that they won't support a piece of media because it represents something they do not wish to endorse. And that logic leads to people getting fired for tweets they made a decade ago. And people getting ostracized for their political beliefs. And political divisions in this country growing and growing. And honestly, getting involved in politics is one of the last things that I'd recommend a corporation do. You can see how well it's working out for Blizzard. We absolutely are mature enough as a medium to handle that. We are mature enough as a medium to explore these topics. Alright then, remember that one too! Because without politics in games, you don't get Missile Command with its commentary on nuclear proliferation. You don't get Final Fantasy VII with its environmentalist bent. You don't get the Call of Duty series military patriotism, or even Just Cause's take on covert regime change. And you don't get Mass Effect Andromeda or Call of War as the Cartel. Extra credits is not the first to argue that all media or all art is political. Some people go so far as to say that making art apolitical in itself is a political act. And no, just no, that is one of the most stupid things that I've ever heard. Ignoring all of the millions of counterexamples of art or media that was never intended to be political, I've worked on media myself with absolutely no desire to make it political. Sometimes I have gone out of my way to make a political work, and sometimes I just want to make funny things happen. Even personally, not all the media that I create is political. And the ones that I made that weren't political, it wasn't me just making some grand conscious choice to be a radical. And this wouldn't bother me so much if it wasn't for the fact that the idea that all media is political is one of the most destructive ideas when it comes to media analysis and art creation. This kind of stuff ruins art and it ruins culture. And I don't mean it in the traditional sense, like people talking about what everything really means hampering the experience for the average viewer. No, it often means destroying or breaking down art if it doesn't fit into your political worldview in some way, shape, or form. This is a huge problem with media analysis and reviewing right now. When you believe that all media is political, it means censoring art from people who lived in a different time with a different set of morals. The arguments in this video and this logic, we should just probably abandon and remove everything that was written from a time where slavery was a normal thing, because the people who wrote them had their own set of beliefs that they probably just slipped in, intentionally or not. Not to mention that this is really popular with another belief, death of the author. Death of the author is the belief that the author's interpretation is just as valid as anyone else's, which is often used to project politics onto a work that it was never intended to have. To use a term from a video game, it results in a lot of people adding lampposts to works that didn't have them originally. For example, Miss Pac-Man is often derided as a sexist video game, making the girls version of a very popular game. Kind of like making a toy pink or something. When in reality, Miss Pac-Man was made by another company without permission of Namco, or the creator of Pac-Man. It was also made technically better in every single way with additional levels, better graphics, and more challenging AI. So you're gonna have to explain to me how it's sexist towards women to make the girls' version of the game even better than the quote-unquote boys' version of the game. Miss Pac-Man is an objectively better game than the original Pac-Man, both of which, by the way, were attempts to market to women. They were both the girls' version of video games at the time. The original Pac-Man was the first game to try and capture a female audience, and the second game tried to encapsulate on that more. 
but 40 years later, what you hear is that Miss Pac-Man is sexist because you took the Pac-Man and you put a bow on his head. The idea of death of the author makes the objective reality and the modern interpretation both equally valid when that is objectively not true. To believe that all media is political means that you have to project politics on the media that is clearly not political. And that can lead to many, many problems. The least of which is you blathering on like an idiot. And you probably know what's next. There you are, playing the PvP in your World War II shooter. And all of the sudden, you're a Nazi. You didn't ask for this. You didn't choose this. Yet there it is. And it's treated no differently than playing a British soldier. Oh my god, they got a different host! who is uh, also named Dan. This will be either very easy or very confusing. But now that we got past the obvious problem, wh what exactly were you saying? There you are, playing the PvP in your World War II shooter, and all of a sudden, you're a Nazi. You didn't ask for this. You didn't choose this. Yet there it is. And it's treated no differently than playing a British soldier. Oh, okay then. Gonna be one of these, huh? Hey, uh, Dan, I'm a little bit tired. Can you explain to Dan exactly what the problem is with what Dan just said? We absolutely are mature enough as a medium to handle that. We are mature enough as a medium to explore these topics. Yeah, I mean, you guys would obviously believe that gamers could handle playing as Nazis, as you advertised World of Tanks a couple of weeks before this episode. I hope those sponsors are still pretty happy with you, because it was a, uh, World War II game. Let's get the other very obvious stuff out of the way first. Yes, the opening is cringy as hell, and it has been memed to death. Yes, the Nazis in the video are wearing the Iron Cross, a symbol still used in Germany today, instead of the swastikas that the Nazis are actually known for wearing. Yes, this video might challenge YouTube 2019 Rewind in its amount of dislikes. And yes, this is basically them backpedaling on the years and years that they spent defending video games, talking about the good the video games can do and how mature the medium actually is. I don't want to be a hypocrite here, so I'm going to try and take this video as seriously as I can. I'm going to try my best to take it as seriously as I can. The fundamental problem, which everyone seems to point out, is that the Extra Credits team is basically taking a game of cops and robbers too seriously. In a game like this, someone has to play the villain. In World War II, the villains were the Nazi, and that's why we have the Allies facing the Axis in World War II games. I mean, it is possible to make an alternative and have every single person be on the same team, make everyone allies, and just have some sort of thing where you simulate the horrors of friendly fire and how PTSD causes some people to crack on the battlefield and gun down allies. But I don't think that would make you happy because it's not quite respectful to the very respectful concept of war. Even if you put aside all of the people who have had traumatic experiences with these groups, who have lost loved ones to terrorists, or who have had generations of their families wiped out by Nazis. Okay, here is a rule of thumb for anyone who wants to fight for social justice. Never! be more offended than the people you're fighting for. Because if you are, you come off as truly disrespectful. If someone truly suffered in the Holocaust, I would doubt that some of their biggest problems, you know, after having their entire family wiped out, losing everything that they've ever had, being branded and treated as subhuman, I highly doubt that one of their biggest problems, or even a blip on their radar, is that people get to play the bad guys in a World War II simulator. And it's very disgusting that you would assume something so trivial would even compare to everything else that they went through. You see, this is the kind of asinine things that you have to argue when you believe that all media is political. No one should have to put on the costume of an ideology they find abhorrent without actually opting into it in your game. And by making people do so, we get them to stop thinking about it. You know, I really wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt saying that maybe the arguments in this video were being blown out of proportion or something. And I guess they kind of are. People often claim that this video says that if you play as a Nazi in a video game, you'll become a Nazi. But no, what they're actually arguing is that if you play as a Nazi in a video game, then you will be okay with Nazis in the real world. And no matter how much backpedaling or weaseling with words they say, that is what they are arguing. Honestly, this episode should be shown in debate classes because it's a perfect showcase of so many fallacies. Most obviously, the slippery slope fallacy. It really is the 2019 version of the Jack Thompson debate. No, video games that let you be violent don't make you be violent, but video games that let you be a Nazi, well, they make you okay with Nazis. And maybe even support them. Now, does this make us totally ignore the history that comes with them? No. But for some people, it moves them from the territory of revolting to just edgy. No. You wanna know what makes Nazis sound edgy? It's a very well-kept secret, so you're gonna have to come close. Closer. 
a little bit closer. You, you dumbass! It's not the video game where you play as a Nazi that makes Nazis seem edgy, but the people who take time out of their day being offended that you play a Nazi in a video game that has no real-world implications. People become edgy or have an edgy sense of humor specifically to piss people like you off. You! That's why those who are edgy have taken up things like clowns or Peppy the Frog or the OK sign or drinking milk or whatever the next thing that you let 4chan decide is racist. They don't do it because they're racist. They do it because it gets idiots like you to clutch their pearls. It means you might not take iron crosses all over a website as a warning sign that you should immediately leave. And if you don't leave, you might start reading and buying into hateful ideas there. You do know that Germany still uses the Iron Cross as a symbol in their forces to this day, right? Pretty sure it's on their website right now. So let it be known that Extra Credits thinks that you're a bad person if you sign up for military service in Germany. Yes, the Nazis did use that symbol, but that's not the symbol that they're known for. And everyone here knows that, including the Extra Credits team. And I'm guessing that the reason why they didn't use this symbol throughout this video is because of the logic within the video. They're probably terrified to do it. I'm guessing that they think that if they start drawing swastikas, even in an educational context, they'll become more accepting of Nazis and wanting to do more Nazi things. Would anyone be surprised if that was the case? Because they're not doing that, though, it leads to actual misinformation. There's no way around it. The Iron Cross is a symbol still used in Germany today by people who aren't Nazis. And this is a country that has some very strict rules about how you can and can't depict Nazis and World War II. If you don't know, Germany has a pretty harsh stance on Nazi depictions. I have a feeling the Extra Credits team would be against Nazis appearing in any piece of media, even if it was to demonize them. They probably think that Schindler's List is a terrible piece of media because it needed to have some actors playing the Nazis. Same with Saving Private Ryan or any World War II film. I mean, could you imagine the kind of person who would actually want to play a Nazi in a movie? I mean, they must be some terrible people in real life if they could just stand by and wear the uniform, even if it's in the context of a movie. It seems like such a small and simple thing, but it's things like this that erode our safeguards against dangers we sacrifice so much to fight. Still on the slippery slope, huh? If you're wondering, they're trying to argue that A leads to Z, but they're on about A leading to F right now. So they've still got a ways to go. So far, their argument is this. One, you play as a Nazi in Call of Duty. Two, you start drawing swastikas or iron crosses or whatever in real life. Three, you start going to Nazi websites. Four, you start shouting Nazi things in real life. By the time you've played 100 hours of being a Nazi, their voice stabs become memes and in-jokes with your friends. By the thousandth time you've respawned as a terrorist, you're either celebrating them or making fun of them. Neither of which helps the global crisis we have that takes thousands of lives every year. Okay, you have to stop right now. You have just pissed me off. Like, some people say something so stupid or just so plain wrong, it actually takes me a moment to process it. So I'm going to need to go through this word by word here. By the thousandth time you respond as a terrorist, you're making fun of them. Okay, now please explain to me why that's a bad thing. No, seriously, I want to know why you think that making fun of these people is a bad thing. Let's teach some history to the channel that's known for teaching history now. Let's go back to World War II. There was a lot of political satire at the time. You know, making fun of the Nazis. This political satire convinced a lot of people to fight against the Nazis. Most famously was the Charlie Chaplin film, The Great Dictator. He had such a hatred for the Nazis that he made a film daring to mock Hitler when no one else at the time had the balls to do so, encouraging a lot of people to actually go and fight and turn against the Nazi party. He made fun of them, he mocked them, and it helped turn the tide against them. Do you know what it requires to mock something? It requires you to have no respect of something to mock it. And things like Nazis and terrorists are things that you should have no respect for. They are people who should be mocked and ridiculed. Their ideas and their actions are terrible. Do you think that South Park made the episode Osama Bin Laden has party pants because they liked the guy or they were desensitized to him? No, terrorists, Nazis, whatever. What they want to do is cultivate an environment of fear. And by going out of your way and making fun and mocking them, it takes away the exact thing that they want. Fear is power and laughter takes the fear away. People have risked their lives and even died making fun of people like terrorists. They died to show their stance against what the terrorists believed in. So what do we do? That's easy. Don't make them morally equivalent. You know, that is my absolute favorite part of multiplayer shooters in games like Call of Duty. Stopping after every single match just to get a ton of story. 
ton of backstory as to who my character is and why he is doing what he's doing. I don't need to play more than once every 30 minutes. Just 30 minutes of story, then five minutes of gameplay, back to 30 minutes of more story. It's the quintessential thing I need to play a game of Capture the Flag. Frame PvP as a training exercise. Oh, okay, now I understand this video. Playing as a Nazi is bad, but playing a guy playing a Nazi, that's good. I want to take a moment to talk about a game that Extra Credits has talked about in one of their games you might have tried. It's called I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, and there will be spoilers for that game in this video. Now the game gives no real mention to who each of the characters are or what they did at the start. All you know as the player is that each of them are in a world controlled by an evil computer called Om, and they are tortured by their demons. In the game, one of the five characters you play as is called Nimdok. As you play as him, you learn that he was a Nazi. Not just any Nazi, but someone who was a scientist who worked in a death camp under Mengele. This isn't even found in the story that the game is adapted from. It was completely added for the game, so there really is little way of a player going into the game knowing about this. You didn't ask for this, you didn't choose this, and it was in a game that Extra Credits recommended. Compare that to the multiplayer shooters that these people are complaining about, where you do know and you do understand that playing as a Nazi within it is a distinct possibility. True, I have no mouth and I must scream doesn't quote unquote normalize Nazis, but neither does a World War II shooter that takes place in World War II where Nazis existed. And it's really easy for me to assume that this team would have problems with depictions of Nazis just in general. After all, even if they show the Nazis doing the most despicable, heinous things imaginable, the player base, you know, of mostly grown adults, could just find it edgy and cool. And I mean, if you're not trusting your audience, the same team recommended a game where you need to have a very mature mind to actually play it and enjoy it. But at the same time, they seem to assume that if you play as a Nazi in a video game, that you will start a slippery slope down a very dark path, assuming that their audience is incredibly feeble-minded. These two things are very contradictory, and outright hypocritical of this team. This is the same channel that said cancelling Six Days in Fallujah was wrong because video games could be used to tackle difficult subject matter. Remember that episode? I think it's time to revisit an old topic, standing up for our medium. Now, video games are no stranger to controversy by any means. Like most new media, games have experienced their share of growing pains. We've had them all. Video games cause violent behavior, video games encourage crime, video games cause addiction, video games socially cripple children, video games cause obesity, this game's a porn simulator, that game's a murder simulator, games cause this or that school shooting... <sighs> good times. I remember a time when you seemed to actually care about a medium that was increasingly marginalized at the time. Watching their Face in Controversy episode back to back with their Stop Normalizing Nazis episode, it's like watching the fall of the Roman Empire and fast forward. Perhaps even more shameful is how rarely we stand up for the work we do. I could bring out quote after quote from this video. One of the main videos that made me a fan back in the day. But nowadays, extra credits is one of the entities that thinks that video games cannot express themselves like any other media. They believe that controversial video games are, as Dan puts it, coming from a toy maker gone rogue and not a team of designers, artists, and experts. A good example of a game that does this is Rainbow Six Siege. All of your bomb diffusion and hostage rescue multiplayer with no normalizing terrorists. If we're going all the way on the crazy train, Rainbow Six Siege is a game that has guns. You know, guns. And as we all know, guns in media are the number one cause of shootings in the real world. And remember, Dan's arguing that people can easily be swayed towards Nazism, even if it's something that's only barely showcased in a World War II game. But in all of these games, shooting people is the whole point. Don't you think that that's going to influence someone? Because that's more the focus of the game? That's what people actually want to do when they buy the game? What do you think that's gonna do to them? And also, Rainbow Six Siege is still a violent video game, and maybe little Timmy will want to throw a grenade at his sister if he plays a game for adults who are able to make their own decisions. Also, because there are no terrorists and the characters within the game do use real weapons, it is kind of glorifying friendly fire, isn't it? So I guess they're very much okay with attacking soldiers on their own side. I guess Extra Credits really does not like any form of military. It seems like they absolutely despise it. You see what happens when you look way too into things that you shouldn't? You make innocent people sound very, very horrendous, and it's actually a really despicable thing to do. It's not just incompetent, it's actively malicious. In fact, by having all of the characters as counter-terrorists training for a possible threat, it highlights how real and present of a threat that is. Uh... Okay, what? Because the counter-terrorists 
are always practicing and never actually going out on a real mission. It highlights how pressing the problem is. Oh, okay, I'm sure that makes sense in whatever storm drain that you've been drinking from. Don't have players randomly spawn in as one or the other. Allow players to choose which side they're on. Now, of course, this has all sorts of in-game problems, such as creating shorter wait times for fascists, but you know what? Those wait times could be artificially extended. Wait, what? You do know that in a multiplayer shooter, if one side has to wait, the other side also has to wait, right? You can't just make an artificial wait time for one side like that. Wow, just when you thought this video couldn't get any worse, we've gone from video games cause untold violence in the real world to Mom, I can't pause an online video game! And if you're going to say, but we need it for historical reasons, then your game better actually be historical. Oh dear, oh dear, dear, dear. We are attacking history now. I guess then I shouldn't be surprised about their latest history videos. Rob and I have had a talk about not getting too specific about the painful stuff in this episode. Haven't we, Rob? Yeah, right? We're not going to have another flu pandemic series on our hands, are we, Rob? Good. Because we all realize now that not everyone spends their days doing research in museums full of human bodies. You wanna know how you normalize the terrible things that have happened in history? You become afraid to talk about them. You obscure them in innuendo, and you make the horrors that happen feel so much less so. Those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. It's a phrase that often gets repeated, but it's a lesson that's not really taken to heart much of late, it seems. When you become afraid to talk about the atrocities that were committed in the past, you start to forget that asylums were actually really fucking horrible. And the people who went through the concentration camps probably experienced things that would make them not really care about who LARPs as the bad guy in a video game. History is not going to be PG. It's never going to be PG. History is really fucked up. And sugarcoating it does a disservice to the people who were actually hurt and makes us blind to the future. Honestly, this is one of the more worrying trends when it comes to things like YouTube demonetization. How it affects the history channels here. So many of them are being attacked, demonetized, and deranked because history was an incredibly violent place. I'm not too sure, but I think the definition of history is people fucking each other over in the worst ways possible. History is very un-PC, and it's certainly not advertiser-friendly. Imagine censoring or downplaying Roots or Schindler's List because the material inside makes someone squeamish. I mean, this might just be a one-off example, but I have to wonder, what else are they downplaying? What else are they ignoring in their history series? You can no longer say we need to have players take up arms in service of terror or hate. You do know how video games work, right? What they have literally argued for is that you should make every World War II multiplayer video game unbalanced and unfun. Do you know what that'll do? That won't create socially conscious games or make people more socially aware. What it will do is kill the subgenre entirely. People won't buy it anymore, and they'll move on to something else that you'll probably also find problematic. And look, we're not saying we can't have games about World War II or about terrorism. We're not even saying we shouldn't make games where you play as a Nazi or a terrorist. But what we are saying is that the fact that you're playing as a Nazi or a terrorist in a game has to mean something. Cause it's political, right? Every single World War II multiplayer shooter has to be a political statement. No, it's not. And that's an asinine bit of logic. And really, if we are saying anything in this episode, it's this. Games can do better. What, what does that even mean anymore? No, seriously, I wanna know. What does that mean to you? Yes, games can do so much better, completely making an entire subgenre of games feel unfun and completely killing it because you have hangups over a costume. I'm sorry, but that is pathetic. All it requires is that we in the game industry be cognizant of the world around us. After this episode, they dismissed everyone who had a problem with the episode as bigots, and whoever runs their PR department said that they were glad to lose these people. So please, do not talk to me about being cognizant of the world around us. On second thought, don't talk to me about anything ever again. If you'll pardon the metaphor that might come across as insensitive, watching extra credits has kind of been like watching someone you know succumb to an addiction. What they are gets morphed into something unrecognizable. Everyone can see that what they're doing is hurting them and destroying anything worth caring about, but they still stick with their addiction no matter what kind of damage it does to them. This review hurt. Going back and forth between the videos that I used to love to the things that are doing today, it hurt more than most of the things I do. Extra credits, pretending to care about marginalized people. While ignoring practices like loot boxes that do take advantage of marginalized people. 
defending the industry on the worst, most indefensible practices, while shouting about the consumer's toxicity. You guys really are no different than Jack Thompson, or any of the other moral guardians that thought the video games were nothing better than a toy. Not just that, but you think that the audience who consumes them is either stupid or morally deficient. There is no other way to justify this final video, unless you think the people who play video games are morally or mentally deficient. How long has it been? Eight long years? Maybe after all this time, while you still have any dignity left, you just might want to call it quits and retire. Cause it's only gonna get worse for the extra credits team, I know that much. Because they're not ones to talk about mental superiority or moral superiority. There are plenty of arguments and accusations against the team. This isn't too relevant to the review itself, but you definitely should look into this on your own time to know what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, their audience still doesn't know what happens to the extra credits indie fund after the crowdfunding prowess and surgery, despite their promise to be open about it. And so many former members of extra credits don't really have a good thing to say about working on the team. The only thing I could never figure out in all my research is, were the people behind the show always like this, or did they just hide it well? Or did something change along the way? Yeah, games can do better. I'm not so sure that extra credits can anymore, though.